observe, I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you happy with who you're becoming? That sounds like an odd question, doesn't it? Should, shouldn't I ask, like, are you happy with who you are? Well, if I ask you if you're happy with who you are, it, that's a done deal. There's nothing that we can do about it. That's just the way that it is. But this is a more hopeful question that I asked this morning. I'm not asking who you are, if you're happy with who you are. I'm asking, are you happy with who you're becoming? Because there's hope in that. There's an opportunity for change. There's something to look forward to, something to become. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning is who are we becoming? We're in a series called The Power to Change. Uh, this is where we have been. Today, we are talking about breaking good. How many people have heard of breaking bad? Right? Yeah, we're not going to break bad. We're going to break good so that we look more like Jesus Christ. And if you have any questions about what we've covered before, uh, you can always go back onto our YouTube channel, onto our Facebook page, onto our website, wordserve.org slash sermons, and catch up. So last week we talked about forming good habits, but as good as good habits are, we, we need to break some bad habits. But I don't want you to break badly. I want you to break bad habits in a good way. In other words, we're going to break good today. So if I ask you uh, right now, uh, who are you becoming? You might have some various answers, but my hope and prayer of, of all the things that we are becoming as a church is that we're becoming more like Christ, because that's the point, right? Uh, what's our mission word, sir? Making disciples. Making disciples. There you go. That is what it's all about, because as we become more like Christ, this world becomes more the kind of place that we would want to live in, more the kind of place that glorifies him. So who are we becoming? Hopefully, we're becoming more like Christ. But how many people are there yet? How many people are totally like Christ? <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> My hand was up to try and goad you. I am not like Christ. And you who know me know this, right? I am not anywhere close. Now, for some, that might frustrate you. Man, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to be Jesus. That doesn't mean we shouldn't keep the journey going, though, right? Because we can come a long way from where we start. And, and that also is my hope. Now, no one sets out to, to totally throw this in the trash, right? Nobody goes, you know what? I'm going to wake up today, and uh, I'm going to be a drug addict. Yeah, I, I'm going to be uh, completely broke and homeless. I'm going to be the meanest parent ever. N nobody does that. Uh, and maybe in a less drastic example, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be uh, sick anymore. I, I'm not going to be unemployed anymore. I'm not going to be... And we fill in the blanks, but these things still continue to happen. Do you ever wonder how that happened? I mean, we, we have the best of intentions, and yet things still happen that we don't want to have happen. Like I said, nobody sets out to have those things happen, so how is it that they happen? Well, you, you've probably been there. You know, it's frustrating to live this life. Grand intentions. You know, this is the year. We're going to do it this year. We're going to, as a family, eat fresh food. Nobody has that goal? Okay. <laughs> We're going to eat good stuff. We're going to eat, you know, the, they always tell you shop around the outside of the grocery store, pick up that stuff. That's what you eat. We're going to eat home-cooked meals. We're going to sit down. We're going to eat together. And that is the intention. That might even be a New Year's resolution. But then life happens. And this is all good stuff. We're taking care of business. We're working long hours. Maybe it's transporting the kids to all the activities that we have, and pretty soon, you know, that whole idea of, of shopping for the fresh food. How many people have a science experiment growing in their fridge right now? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I put it there. Uh, but it gets pushed back to the back because we're so busy, and it, and it grows something that probably should not be consumed, and we just have to throw it away. But you know what happens in the meantime? We go, man, I'm so busy providing for the family. I'm so busy taking my kids to this, that, and the other. I'm so busy doing great things in the community you know what, I'm just going to run through McDonald's. Uh, it'll just take a second, and you got to eat. you got to fuel the body, right? And that happens once, and you go, you know what, that was pretty easy. Uh, darn, man, I'm running behind again. Let's just, let's just go through the drive. Hey, kids, I know you're in your soccer outfit, but we're just going to drive through McDonald's. That way you don't have to get out of the car. We're not going to be late to practice. And one or two isn't going to do it, right? But 10 or 12... Okay, 100 or 112, right? After a while, it starts to add up. And, and my point is this. Nobody makes a decision to go off track in one decision. It's a series of small things, and that's how it gets by us, I'm convinced. It's the series of small things that we don't pay attention to that catch up to us. And it happens all the time. It's not the big one thing that happened to us that got us derailed. It's the many small things. 
And there's hope in that because if we recognize that, if we take that and we turn those many small things to good, then we can get good results long term. But it is tough, is it not? Is it, isn't it hard for you, us to do the right thing? I, it is for me. These habits start so small. This is a slide from last week. And what we talked about last week, just as a quick review, is that God does big things through small habits. We used the example of Daniel last week. But if you look at this, this, this first one, is just a t- it looks like a domino sized. And you know that a domino can't topple that big panel in the back. There's no way. But that domino, over time, as it adds up, it gains momentum like a snowball rolling downhill, and pretty soon it's unstoppable. And pretty soon you find yourself as, you know, man, I've been to McDonald's so many times, I'm going to write the connoisseur's guide to McDonald's, right? And you sell this on the ebook, and you can, you can pay for you know, that food delivery service, whatever, right? But you, you get so much into that that this becomes now your lifestyle. Uh, you know, you, you, <laughs> the connoisseur's guide to McDonald's, you know, where, the, where eating fresh means they changed the grease last week, right? That's fresh, yeah? But nobody wants that, but that's how we end up there, those little things over time. So why is it so hard? How do we deal with it? What can we do about it? Well, here's what I think. I think it's a huge uphill battle. Those tiny little things are a huge uphill battle, and, and here's why. There's two reasons. Two primary reasons. One is a lot of what we do is a habit. By default, the habits we don't pay attention to. That's why it's a habit. We don't have to think about it. That's the way that our brain is wired. Our brain has uh, primary functions of conserving energy so we don't run out and and drop dead. Uh, It wants to avoid pain, and it wants to seek pleasure. That's That's what our brain is doing. So a habit does all of that. It automates things. Did anybody drive here this morning and not remember how you got here? If you've been, well, if you're new, that didn't happen to you. But <laughs> if you drove here a million times before, you're not even thinking of it. It's just a habit. That's conserving energy so your brain can do more important things, supposedly. So 40%, ex- ex- experts estimate that 40% of what we do is a habit. We don't even pay attention to it. That could be good or bad. If it's good habits, 40% are good. If it's bad habits, 40% of what we do is bad. Now, teachers in the crowd... If you automatically take 40% off of a test and you score 60% on your test, what grade am I getting? Uh, it's been a while since I've been in school. but That's, that's D minus at best, probably failing, right? So, and and it's, we're not even aware of it. So if we take that 40% and we turn it to good, we get an automatic boost of 40% that we're not paying attention to for the good. That sounds pretty good to me. So part of the reason that we don't address these little things is it's a habit. We don't even pay attention to it. So what I'm trying to do this morning is to draw your attention to the little things, not the big thing at the end, the little thing right now and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. That's what we're going to work on today. The other reason that we don't think habits are that big a deal, like that drive through McDonald's, and again, I'm not slamming McDonald's or any of that. It's just a part of life. But part of what we do is we say, you know, I can handle that. Uh, my pride and my ego say, that's not going to get me. I'm good. Well, let me tell you, it is going to get us. And here's why. Let's go back to that brain wiring thing here for a second. Are you motivated by pain or pleasure? Most of us are motivated to seek pleasure and avoid pain. That's the way that the brain is wired. So here's the problem when it comes to shedding bad habits and forming new good habits. The bad habit, let's just start there. The bad habit, the pleasure happens when? Right now. When does the pain happen? Maybe never, or at least later, right? So I'm in a condition where, yeah, my bad habit, I I feel the pleasure right now. This is what I want. My brain wants to do this. It's a habit. I'm not thinking about it. And I decide that, um, let's take some practical examples. I am uh, notorious for hitting the snooze button, let's say. I'm not, but let's say I was, right? So I snooze in the morning because my brain, when that alarm goes off, because I've, I've said it early because I'm going to read my Bible 15 minutes a day like I talked about last week. Everybody's doing that, right? Everybody have a problem with honesty? No? No, okay. Good. No, but if I did set my alarm early because I want to get up early, and you know what? The alarm goes off. My brain says, what is it going to seek? It's going to seek pleasure. It's going to seek comfort. It's going to seek conserving energy, and you know what? I can accomplish all of that with a snooze button right now. 
Doesn't it feel so good in the morning? The alarm goes off. It's kind of cold. Maybe it's rainy. The blankets are all warm. It's dark. Just snooze. Oh, man, that feels so good, doesn't it? And the pleasure is right now. The problem is that whatever it was that we set ourselves to to do, that small habit, that 15 minutes a day, isn't getting done. So the good habits aren't being developed, and the pain will come later. When I haven't changed over the course of a year, I'm still the same person I was. Why isn't this working? It's because of that snooze button. Let's take a, a more drastic example. Maybe you can relate to this. Um, let's just say I've been a couch potato for five years, and I'm tired of that, so I decide I'm going to start running. And so when the alarm goes off in the morning, the first thing, I've laid out my clothes. You know, we made it attractive like we talked about last week. All i got to do is get out of bed, put on my running clothes, go right out the door. What's the problem with that? Well, if I start that new good habit, when's the pain going to come? Right now, right? <laughs> as soon as I take about the fifth step, I'm like, that was a bad idea. Right? Why am I doing this to me? Why, God? Why? Right? The pain happens right now. When does the pleasure happen? Way later. Like, way, like if ever, right? And talk about conserving energy. Your brain is going, are you nuts? I can't even breathe. This thing in my, I've got a stitch in my side. I can't breathe. This is dumb. Stop. What are you doing? So you see how hard it is to create a good habit. Because in good habits, new habits, the pain is now, the pleasure comes later. In bad habits, the pleasure is now, the pain comes later. Which are we more likely to do? The old bad habit. That's why this is so hard. We're wired that way. So James has a solution for us. Have, have you ever spent any time in the book of James? Let me know if you have. Yeah? James, I always, I always tell people James is like cheesecake. It is very dense and very rich. You can only read a few verses at a time, and your brain will explode. So what we're going to do is we're going to read just a little bit today. And, and for those of you who uh, play the home game, if you want to follow along in your Bibles or your apps or whatever, I'm going to be reading from James chapter 1, verses 19 through 22. And what we do is uh, I'm putting the main idea that I want you to get out of the passage on the wall so you can concentrate on the main idea. I'll read the rest. You can follow along if you like. Here's what James says. And this is the key, by the way, to how we form those new, good, godly habits. Here we go. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because our anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. These are the words of God for the people of God, and for these words we are grateful. Did you catch what Paul's answer is to getting rid of those bad habits and forming the new ones? Get rid of. Get rid of. Now, I left the, that, that part blank. What he says is get rid of all the stuff that is around us that is so morally prevalent in our society around us. It's drawing us away from our godliness, from our closeness to Christ. I left it blank because for each of us, that's going to be something different. What is it for you? How would you fill in that blank? What do you need to get rid of so that God's word can grow? Because what he says right after that is humbly accept the word that is planted in you. Here's the problem with God's word. I have no doubt that God's word is planted. What I have trouble with is, how's the garden it is growing in? Are the cares and concerns of this world choking it out? Has my heart become so hardened that it can't penetrate through and form good roots? Or am I just so apathetic that I don't even bother to let it take root? I have to get rid of all that stuff for God's word to be what it needs to be in me. God's word can do it. I have no doubt. God could just come down and make it happen, but that's not the way this works. He invites us into this thing where we grow together. We grow in in that Christ-likeness, in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, with the support of everyone around us, because it's an uphill battle, as we've seen. That's what I'm looking for. So what is it, word serve, that you need to get rid of this morning? Now, notice what I say. I'm not saying... Push it to the side. I'm not saying hide it under a blanket. I'm not saying, you know, make it so you don't see it right up front. No, get rid of it. Totally. No questions asked. 
And this is a great time of year. As we approach Ash Wednesday, as we approach the season of Lent where we're giving things up, why don't we give up whatever's holding us back from God? Why don't we give up whatever's choking us out when it comes to living like Christ? And I'll tell you why we don't. Because it feels good now, and the pain is pushed off. And for us to change, word sir, it's going to hurt, at least at first. But stick with it. Stay the course. And through the end of that pain, you're going to find a pleasure that is far greater than anything we can imagine. Why? Because we're finally living into the true self that God created us to be. All the stuff, as James says, all the things that are around us are not what is intended for us to find pleasure in. The things that we seek are good in, in, in its base core. The sense to want to belong, the sense to want to be loved, that's all good. But sometimes we warp the response to that need. And that's where the bad habits come in. And as we know, it's the little things over time that make the big difference. So what is it that we need to get rid of? Let's go back to the habit loop, and let's talk practically now. How do we get rid of this? Bill, I, it sounds great. I'm sold. I'm in. I need to get rid of, and I know what my blank is, or I'm going to go home, and I'm going to write my blanks. And, and by the way, my blanks, I'm on page three right now. But you, you do you, okay? So let's look at this habit loop. We talked briefly. There's a cue. Something catches your attention. It's going to cause a craving. And again, these cravings that I'm talking about, they are not bad things in and of themselves. A sense to belong, a sense to want to be loved, a sense of, of security and safety. These are not bad things, but sometimes our response and how we pursue them can be. And that's where it starts to turn. And then there's a reward. The problem is that the reward might be a short-term reward that feels really good in the moment, but leads to disaster. Ask any addict if their reward feels good at the time, and they will say yes. But ask any addict over time, was the reward worth it? And the answer will be almost universally, no. It was not worth it. I lost my family. I lost my job. I lost everything. For what? For temporary fleeting pleasure. Not the God-designed pleasure that never leaves us. Not the true self that we were created to be. It's the world talking through us. So how do we do this? I'm going to make this super simple. Where does this whole loop it start? It starts at the cue. So when you're thinking about what is it I need to get rid of, don't think about the whole thing. Think about what is the cue to the bad habit I have. Get rid of that. Let's go back to my alarm clock example. Let's say that I'm having this snooze war and I'm losing. Right? So the first thing I can do is I can get rid of that cue. The cue is the snooze button because it feels so good. Right? Boom. So you know what you do? You remove the cue. You take your alarm clock or your phone and you put it across the room. Yeah, and now if you're married and sleeping in the same bedroom, your spouse is going to hate you because <laughs> what's going to happen is it's going to go off and you're going to go, oh, man, and it's going to go off for like 10 minutes while you find, okay, look, it's not going to go away. I got to get up and do something about it, and by the way, now the whole house is awake, right? So kind of agree on what time you're getting up if you're doing this, all right? But you're going to get up and you're going to go, and now, well, now I'm already up. I might as well put on those running clothes and get out the door. I might as well. Go out there where I have carefully set out my Bible and sit down to read for 15 minutes a day. I might as well, whatever it is that you're going to do. Remove the cue, and it works. How many people spend less than five minutes on social media per day? Wow, I am impressed. Because most people, if you look statistically, do not. Social media is a time suck. It will just draw you in and capture you. And two hours later, when you're watching dogs water skiing, you're going, where did my life go? <laughs> you're laughing because it's true. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, right? So maybe that's my problem. Okay, if social media is my problem, spending screen time is my problem, remove the cue. So don't allow, there's apps that you can put on your phone that won't allow you but a certain amount of time per day. Take it away. Don't even tempt yourself. Don't go, no, I've got this. I've got this. No, we don't got this. Time will tell. So take it away. Maybe there's websites that you're visiting that you shouldn't visit. There are, there are uh, programs that you can put on your computer that will block those sites. 
or if that's not even enough because you can figure out a way around that, there are programs that take whatever website you visit and send it to a friend that you designate. So that friend sees every website you visited. Ooh, did anybody just do a sharp intake of breath? <laughs> Boy, that better be a good friend. <laughs> that means one that knows how to keep a secret, right? So these are things that you can get rid of it. Don't even tempt. Don't even get close to that because it is so powerful and so insidious. It's just a little thing. It's just once. No, it's not. That little thing gets its hook, and that little thing becomes the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing, and pretty soon that whole panel in the back of that habits wall comes crashing down. The question is, what does it crash down around? Does it crash down around your family, your marriage, your job, your friends, your God? The hope in all of this is that God never abandons abandons us he never leaves us he never forsakes us he never will he's always there ready to catch us so as we think about this uh, last week we talked about how to form good habits and we did all this so take everything that i said last week when it comes time to stop in a habit and do the exact opposite so if you want to make the cue obvious to do a good habit make it impossible get rid of it if you want to eat nothing but healthy food don't buy junk food. Don't bring it home. Don't put it in the pantry because your willpower will eventually fail. Those Oreos, they have a power, man. They will call you in the dead of the night. Even in above the snooze button, they will get you, right? Just don't have them in the house and you won't eat them. That's the way this works. Everything else that you can think of, the basic needs are good, but sometimes we fulfill them wrong. If you want uh, to kill a response, make it hard. Make it difficult. Make somebody else. If you overspend on Amazon... If your uh, gross national product uh, challenges some economies in the world when it comes to Amazon, uh, give your friend, your trusted friend, your password to Amazon. And then you can only order things through that friend. And that friend has instructions about what your budget is. That better be a good friend. <laughs> and then a reward. Uh, don't settle for fruit substitutes. We talked about this last week. Don't settle for fruit substitutes. It feels good right now, but it won't later. Settle only for the original fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Kindness, joy, gentleness, peace, self-control. I almost sang the tune. I got a tune last week. I got forwarded a kid's song. I promise I'll sing it one day, right? That's how we do this. Now, when you come to the cues, I'm, I'm just going to list these up here because, again, every one of us is different. We have different cues, different things that set us off. But I want you to look at some of these things. Sometimes it's a place. Sometimes it's a time, a time of day, a time of season, uh, a time in the year. Sometimes it's our moods. And if you find yourself in this HALT acronym, this is a great one to remember because the enemy is never going to tempt you when you're strong and when you're surrounded with community. The enemy is always going to isolate, wait for you to be tired, wait for you to be distracted, and then there's that little hook that starts the journey, isn't it? So HALT is a great acronym to remember. Are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you tired? Because that's a green flag to the enemy. Don't let that happen. Surround yourself with people. There might be moments in time like, you know what? Every time we get done playing basketball, we always head over to the bar. Well, if alcohol is a problem for you, you need to change your cue. Every time you get done playing basketball, you and you substitute something else. Or maybe you just give up basketball if it's that critical. And finally, the people. You are the average of the five people you hang around the most with. Think about that for a second. Who are the five people you hang around most? If they're not leading, in the, if they're not becoming who you want to become, maybe it's time to reshuffle your deck. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Don't get rid of your family, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Bill said I need to, to jettison my family. No, no, no. This is our mission field, right? I'm talking about outside of your family. The five people you hang around most with are the people you're going to be most like. And vice versa, by the way. So if you're trying to influence someone, you can share this. Hey, you know what? All you got to do is remove the cue. Sounds easy, but it's hard. Let's be accountable to each other. What's your cue that you're trying to get rid of? Here's mine. Let's talk to each other at least once a day. So how's it going? Now, I'm going to share my websites with you. I want you to, to nail me if I, if I do something that I told you I wasn't going to do in a loving way, right? That's how important that this is. 
the people that you hang around. You read Proverbs 13, 20, it'll tell you if you hang around wise people, you're going to become wise. If you hang around fools, well, let's just say it doesn't end well. So as we go forward, I want you to think about this. I'm going to put up this uh, Uversion app. I highly recommend that you download this app. It's called Uversion, spelled just like that. There is a Bible study plan called the Power to Change. It looks like that when you click on it. If you'll download that, search for Power to Change, you can start that reading plan, and it will start you on your way to shedding bad habits, forming good ones. Because as we know, little things over time, that's what God does great things in. Now, whatever it is that you're facing today, I don't want to belittle it. This is powerful stuff. And you might be saying, Bill, I am not strong enough to do this. I've tried. I've tried everything. I've tried to count. Bill, I, I, I'm not strong enough. Well, I'm not either. L let me let you in on a secret. I'm, I'm not either. And while that sounds like bad news, it's really not, because here's the best news of all. This God that we serve, his grace is sufficient, and his power is made perfect in my weakness, in our weakness. That's the strength that we need. So words are... It's not the big things that take us down. It's the little things over time. And here's the best news of all. God's power is more powerful than our patterns. Will you pray with me, please? God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of spiritual disciplines which represent habits. God, I pray for every individual here, whatever they're struggling with, whatever's got this, that you would help us to break that cue, that you would help us to reintroduce the godly cues, the ones that we were made for, the relationships that you created us for, so that we might experience the fruit of the, of the Spirit in our community, in our lives, in our jobs, in our families, in our relationships with others. God, spill out your Holy Spirit on us today so that we might experience that peace, that joy, that love, that kindness, that gentleness, that self-control and all that you have for us, that we might be fully alive and actually be our true selves, not the false self that the world has created around us. God, we give you all thanks, glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.